Good morning, everybody. I'm Robert Carter. I'm a speaker for this organization called Creation Ministries International. I want to start off by just saying thank you for the invitation. I, I do really appreciate uh, the privilege to be able to stand here in your church this morning. I do understand that it's Lord's Day, and therefore we need to focus on God. The things that I'm going to present to you are perhaps not normal for a Sunday morning, but they are centered on the Bible, and therefore they are important. Um, but there's a lot of questions we all have about this whole creation and evolution debate, and therefore let's deal with some of them. I am a marine biologist. I cut my teeth scuba diving in Florida and the Bahamas and Belize. It was, it was a tough life those years. Um, but I ended up in the genetics lab. And as I was studying these beautiful animals, these are corals under a microscope, I was looking at their bright green, bright red, and yellow, and blue pigments, and I said, what are these things? Well, I determined that they're proteins, and once they're proteins, I knew there's genes behind them. And when I stole the genes out of those animals and engineered them into these animals, that's when I got my doctorate. See, I made the Frankenfish. And that opens a giant can of worms, doesn't it? Okay, it says moral. Can we do this? Are we allowed to monkey around with God's creation? Well, for fish, I was not worried. There's a couple laboratories in my university I wouldn't even want to cross the threshold of because they were working on embryology of humans. That's very disturbing. But fish are God's creation. We can eat fish. I think, therefore, we can genetically modify fish. But that's a whole other story for a whole other day. I, though, needed a guide for my research. I found that on the first page of the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. This is God talking to Adam and Eve. He says, God bless them. God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and build the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Okay. That's telling us that God put human beings on this planet to take care of God's creation. By the way, this is where property rights come from. We are to take care of what God has given us to take care of. It's ours to take care of. But this also means that if we're to take care of things, we need to study what God created so we can better take care of it. But that process of learning about God's creation is called science. So science comes to us, first page of the Bible. Let us learn about God's creation so we can better fulfill the mandate that he gave to us to take care of us, he's given to us. That's pretty simple. A lot of what I'm about to present to you has appeared on the pages of our creation magazine. And just as a little subliminal, I mean, just a little hint, I'm going to be popping up little pictures of Creation Magazine uh, as I speak, just to show you that everything I'm presenting to you, I had to learn myself. And most everything I learned was from this. And I'll tell you what, when I first was exposed to this, I was, I think, 19 years old. I was at Georgia Tech. I was barely a Christian. I was an evolutionist. I didn't know what to do with this whole Genesis thing. I knew what it was saying. I didn't want to believe it. And some friends of mine dragged me down to some Baptist church in Atlanta, and there was this creation speaker, and I did not believe him. And yet, now, I am that creation speaker. It took me years to grapple with these subjects. These are difficult, but they're worth dealing with. A lot of other things I'm about to present to you have appeared on our website, creation.com. This, I think we just cracked 15,000 articles. So, if you have a question at the end, you go to creation.com, type something in the search box, and I can almost guarantee you there's going to be an article that addresses that question. And there's a lot of questions. But if you were to ask me when I was a young man, why do I believe in evolution? At that time, I would have said, I think Pacasitas is my lynch man. This at the time was the perfect intermediate form between land animals and whales. I needed no other information. I saw that, and I'm done. Evolution's a fact, I would have said. But what I didn't know at the time was that this fanciful picture was based only on those blue bones. Nothing at all below the neck. And I didn't know that they were about to discover the rest of the pack of seed skeleton. I had no idea that modern depictions of this animal looks more like a four foot long rat dog. There are zero transitional features in that fossil. I was convinced that fossil was a transitional fossil because of the deceit of the picture. And I remember thinking, what else have I been lied to about? And that started me on a lifelong quest for information. 
Do you know, we have more information on this topic than any other time in church history. We should be shouting, the Bible is history. And most people in this nice little conservative community right here I have never heard a Christian defend the Bible. And most Christians have significant questions about some pretty important but also pretty easy to answer questions in the scriptures. So we're, we're as a ministry trying to get into these questions. We took a TV camera. And we went to college campuses all around the world. And we interviewed several hundred students. And we asked them three simple questions. First, did you go to church growing up? If they said no, we said, all right, see, we don't want to talk to you. They said, oh, you did go to church growing up? Our next question was, were you going to try anything about creation and evolution? And the third question was, do you still go to church? What we found was a very strong trend. The churches that preach us from the pulpit, the Sunday schools that discuss us, the families that talk about this over the dining room table, they were raising young people much more willing to stand in the breach in a very anti-Christian, hostile environment called the college campus. We did find, out of hundreds of students, one guy who said, yeah, I went to church growing up, but I've never even heard about creation, and he still went to church. But he was the exception to the very strong rule that we found. So when we talk about statistics, it is clear conservative churches are raising stronger Christians. And that is true across all of the nominal spectrum of America. So we want to reach our culture, though, right? We want to be able to talk to you know our relatives who are like anti us. We want to talk to the, the kid at the grocery store who's got pimples and a nose ring, he's packing his bags, he's got a tattoo like I hate God, right? We want to we want to be able to share Christ with those people. Well, in order to do that, I submit to you, we have to be ready to give the people an alternative to the bad answers to the questions. There are usually one or two things that someone's holding up as the reason they're not accepting Christ. Usually those things can be answered if we can get the person to listen to us, which is another challenge. If you need some help on this, every Friday we put out what we call info bites. We package together several articles, and there's usually one main article that was something the world was talking about that week, and we'll commission one of our authors to write an article for it, put it on our website, and we'll send it out in an email to all the people on our list. And this goes out to uh, a few hundred thousand people. Very important information, very good information, very sound information. If you'd like us to help you in this way, we're going to, as I'm speaking, it's not normal for Sunday, we're going to hand out a um, sign-up form, and we just ask for name, email, address, and a zip code. And the zip code is there because every time we send a speaker out on the road, and there are about 30 of me, and we're going to... Uh, now that COVID is over, we're probably going to address 12 or 1,300 churches around the world this year. We're very busy doing this. But the zip code is there so that when we send a speaker out, we send you an email if you're in some radius and invite you to come. In fact, uh, this weekend uh, in Pella, there was at least one lady and her daughter there that came because they got our, our, info, our little newsletter, like, hey, come here to speak. So those are going to go around when I'm speaking, and we're going to keep on going. But we have to define what the word science means before we get anywhere. This is difficult, because science doesn't have a definition. So if we're going to argue creation, evolution, the age of the earth, Big Bang, all that kind of stuff, how do you define what science is? I'm going to give you two main definitions for science. The first one is called operational science. It deals with observing, and testing, and repeating things today. This is the type of science we learn in eighth grade. It's just basic observations and draw conclusions. This type of science has led to the development of all of our modern technology, including this nuclear powered rover that NASA uses and they drive around Mars today with it. That's crazy technology. And it has nothing to do with the creation and evolution today. But operational science is also pioneered by Christians. Men like Johann Kepler, the great astronomer who discovered the three laws of planetary motion and NASA used to fly things around the solar system, he says it was, more, it was like thinking God's thoughts after him. My friends, science should be magisterial. We should be worshiping God as we learn about what God created. Instead, man has turned that around to deny God, to use the things that God made to try to ignore the reality of the holy God. But it's not just Kepler. 
if you were to list a list of early modern scientists, just about every one of them would be a Christian. Have you, ever, have you ever struggled in science class? Remember those horrible formulas you had to learn? All those complex mathematics? Oh, and all those little letters. And, well, if you get rid of all the Greek letters, what you're left with are Latin letters. And most of those are the initials of a Christian's name. Because modern Christianity laid the groundwork for modern science. It, it was still going in ancient Greece. Yeah, they had a lot of philosophers. They did a lot of math. But if there's a zoo standing on top of a mountaintop with a lightning bolt in his hand, you can't run an experiment and trust the results of the experiment because he might send a lightning bolt down and kill your lab rats in the middle of the night. Or if there are pixies in the garden, you can't leave your test tubes unattended because the pixies might sneak in, rearrange your test tubes, and all of a sudden your experiments mess up and you don't know why. If you can't trust the universe, science doesn't work. The reason we trust the universe is because it was created by the God of the Bible. His very power infuses the universe, and therefore the universe is constant because God is constant. The universe operates according to law because God is the ultimate lawgiver. The universe is trustworthy because God is trustworthy. Those are beautiful thoughts, and those are the thoughts that impelled or propelled the early Christian scientists to start figuring out how the universe works. But they have a problem. And the problem is that most scientists don't believe the Bible. They know that quite well. And one reason for this is because there are other types of science. One other very important type of science is called historical science. This deals with so when you're trying to explain something you didn't see. So you stretch back and you try to pat into the past. And you know, did some stumpy legged fish crawl out of an ocean 500 million years ago? Well, how would anyone to know? We don't have time machines. History happens once. It's not repeatable. It's not experimental science. It's not laboratory science. It's an entirely different animal. But this is where the creation and evolution debate lies. We're not arguing over the mass of one gram of water, the boiling point of water, the speed of light, the force of gravity, the charge of an electron. We're arguing over historical questions. How old is the earth? Are Neanderthals a dead end branch of humanity? Those sorts of questions. So, I'm going to give you a test. Ready? Everyone get out your pen and paper. Just joking. One question test, true or false? There's a dinosaur sinking to the bottom of an ocean. He rocks and he's lying there. His bones are lying there over millions of years, maybe. He's buried and petrified, and then erosion exposes the dead dinosaur right? the plate tectonics lifts these rocks up out of the ocean. True or false? Who says true? Who says false? Who's not going to answer my question? <laughs> of course it's a trick question. Here's a problem. I can imagine that happening. Can you imagine that happening? <coughs> There's what sticks in our brain as being true, even if it's not. And it's hard to get those false ideas out of our minds. And the world knows this, which is why that was a presentation at a children's museum. To start the kids off with wrong ideas that the geologists know don't work. And we know it doesn't work because you know, I'm a marine biologist. Let's get the submarine. Let's look around the bottom of the ocean for a big dead thing. Do you think you're going to see that happening? No. Big dead things eaten or get eaten by all sorts of things. In fact, according to the laws of chemistry, bones dissolve in seawater. Oh. It's a slow and gradual millions of years scenario. It doesn't work for fossils. In fact, science has explain things like this. And this and this. That's a mother ichthyosaur. I say that because there's the baby, half one. Was mama ichthyosaur lying in the bottom of some warm Mesozoic sea for hundreds of thousands of years or so? And she slowly buried this fine sediment and nothing ever gnawed on her bones. She, her bones didn't dissolve, they didn't rot away. The baby's lying there. You know, probably easily disconnected. In fact, recently they found another ichthyosaur, and it's a mother. She has a baby inside, a baby half born, and a baby or right next to her. That's amazing. By the way, this is the reptile equivalent of a dolphin, and just like a dolphin, they're born tail first. Because they breathe air. Very interesting. 
How about this one? This is one of my favorite fossils I've ever seen. It's a salamander. Up on the top, gills. Out in the back, a very thin tail, only a few cells thick. In the stomach, a bunch of clams. Cool. But wait a minute. What turns a salamander to stone? You ever goldfish that dies? They kind of get gross and fuzzy really quickly, right? Head's not in there, yeah. How do you turn a salamander to stone? Does millions of years of geology have a good answer for something like that? Not really. Just to get that fossilized very quickly and petrify it quickly, or it wouldn't exist. Let me give you a biblical model. Here's Goldie. He's happily swimming along in the morning before Noah's flood. Flood starts and he's now overwhelmed by some muddy underwater avalanche, and now he's dead. But wait a minute, he's buried in mud. The mud is full, the water has dissolved salts and minerals in it. And as that water dries out, the salts and minerals are going to form crystals. And if we can soak that into his body before he completely rots away, we might be left with a crystalline equivalent of a fish skeleton. It has to occur quickly and we're not going to get it. We have a documentary on the table here. It's called Evolution's Achilles Heels. I'm very proud of this. We've won two major awards at Christian Film Festivals for our documentary. And all we did was ask Bible-believing PhD scientists one question. In your area of expertise, what can evolution not answer? What a cool question. We captured all these interesting things. This is Dr. Marcus Ross, a good friend of mine. He's a paleontologist. He's a fossil expert. He says, the existence of a fossil by itself is actually proof of something happened very, very fast. And then he says, if a fossil happened fast, the rock that contains the fossil must also have occurred quickly. Now we're talking about the entire fossil record is a record of fast, not slow. Or the fossils wouldn't be that bad. Including things like this petrified tree. It's called a polystrate, a many-layer fossil. It's a fossil that sticks vertically through the geologic column and defies evolutionary time. Because trees don't stick up out of the ground for thousands of years after they die. They get eaten, they get burned, they get termites, mold, fungi. I mean, this, this is not something that's going to happen. We have so many polystyrene trees, there's no soil layer at the bottom, there's no roots. It's as if they were broken off and floated into place during a massive catastrophe. Interesting. You see what I'm doing with all these examples? When you hear a presentation, do you know that the presenter wants you to come to a conclusion? What am I trying to show you? What am I doing? All these examples I just gave you are designed to question time. How much time has there been is a critical question for biblical history. But how much time has there been? How was the universe? Where does the millions of years idea come from? Well, that was given to us by European geologists in the 1700s and early 1800s who were trying to use nothing but natural processes to explain, and nothing but what they could see. They got rid of the flood, they got rid of, of miraculous creation. They said, well, let's see. Oh, the Rhine River is on its banks. Let's go look at it. Oh, look, it went this much sand along the banks of the Rhine. Now look at the Alps. Wow, that's like a mile's worth of sediment. It would take, these floods happen every 50 years or so, <coughs> millions of years to make the Alps. That's exactly the reason that went behind it. But what if slow and gradual doesn't explain what we see? Because that canyon, Grand Canyon, sure doesn't look like it was caused by a tiny little river. Consider this. Three winters ago, I think it was now, the Oroville Dam in Northern California, the highest dam in the United States, nearly failed. They had too much snow melt. And so they had to drain the lake. First, they opened up the secondary spillway and started making lots of erosion. So they stopped that. Then they opened up the main spillway and just let it go. And very quickly, they realized they have a problem. Because honestly, this is not a lot of water compared to the size of the world. This is not a large hill compared to the size of the world. But just over a couple of days, this water flowing down the steel reinforced concrete ate through the steel reinforced concrete and carved a side canyon 1,300 feet long, 400 feet wide. And 160 feet deep through solid rock. That rock is now the gravel out of the river. Wait, I, I thought erosion was slow. Well, yeah, until the water gets too fast, and then all bets are off. 
Now, for all of you who have a boat, have you ever noticed that the back edge of your propeller gets pitted over time? It happens all the time. It's a process called cavitation. When the water's flowing over the surface, flows nice and smooth until it gets a little too fast. And then if there's a little teeny irregularity on the surface, the water will leap up and create a vacuum. And then that imploding vacuum eats through stainless steel. It eats through solid rock. So if you ask me, how long did it take to carve Grand Canyon? I'm going to reply, I don't know. How fast is the water flowing? That's the first question we ask. And as the water is leaving the earth after Noah's flood, we have a recipe for massive amounts of very fast erosion. That might leave some very weird things behind. My great game. Now, I've always been a little nerd. I know that. That's me. You sat right here, too. Man, I missed that. Well, remember those socks that you pulled all the way up to your knees? <laughs> this is me in fifth grade. I'm living in New York State. My parents owned a marina on a bay right near the ocean. I grew up on the water as a fishing boy and clamming and swimming, and it was, a, it was just a lovely place to live. Little towns, 5,000 people, except on holiday weekends, like fellow. Um, just a nice little tight knit community. But I remember at the end of my fifth grade year, I was seeing the sun. I, basically, my bedroom looked east and the sun rose into my window over the ocean. Beautiful place. But the sun was coming up. It was like spooky, weird, eerie red. I was like, something really wrong with the sun. It's red, it's not the normal color. Well, it turns out that a mountain 3,000 miles away from my house had just exploded. I didn't know it as a boy, but now I do. Mount St. Helens has given us an amazing testimony that a lot of geology can happen in a very short amount of time. Including things like this. This is three different layers laid down by that volcano in three different episodes. First, a big eruption in May of 1980. Boom! Splat! There's a layer. Two months or a month later, a boiling hot cloud of steam and volcanic ash came racing down the mountain at the speed of a hurricane and deposited that middle layer. And two years later, some unstable sediments broke free and made a giant mud flow that came down the mountain out onto the plain and deposited the upper layer and carved that canyon. Oh. In fact, if I look at this, I'm, I'm thinking, this looks like a lot of other things in the fossil record. All over the world, things look like that. And yet we know this is deposited rapidly and catastrophically. If you zoom up in the middle layer, you see all these little laminations, these little lines. Geologists before this might have been tempted to say, <clears throat> count up layers, count up the years, slow and gradual, millions of years. No, this is volcanic ashes falling out of the sky, providing us with a great recipe for how many different rocks, many different types of rocks, and many different rock formations can be created quickly. We know it does not take millions of years to form many different types of rock. Okay, I haven't answered the question yet, how old is the earth? Well, let's open to what the scripture has to say. First, we have to acknowledge the Bible claims to be a history book of the universe and a prophecy book of the universe. It claims to explain where everything came from, the reason why everything is the way it is, and where everything is going. That's a big deal. Those are really big claims the Bible makes. In fact, if you look at the first page of your Bible, you'll see it sounding like God creates the entire universe in six consecutive days. Just a few thousand years ago. Hey, Christian, does that embarrass you? I was terrified of this passage. I knew exactly what those words meant, and I tried every way you could imagine to add millions of years to this. I tried stretching out the days. I didn't know that was called the day age theory. I thought I had to come up with growing that even my own. Someone else thought of it. Now, that worked until someone pointed out that you can't get plants millions of years before you get the sun. I said, oh, well, maybe this is just a, maybe a, a poetic expression of evolutionary history. No, because you can't get wells before you get land animals. Evolution has an opposite way around. It's as if not only did God very matter of fact, the state, no ambiguity. I created the entire universe in six days. The way he created it defies naturalistic explanations. If you're struggling with this, 
I want to encourage you to keep struggling. It is worth wrestling with the Word of God, always, if we're willing to accept the answer. If you run up into a brick wall, I believe to my brain this was a brick wall. It was impassable. I can read the Word. I know what the Word say. All God had to do was put a little bit of an ambiguity in there. Somewhere we could add those years and we could have driven a truck through there and just expanded the time of the universe. It doesn't exist. It's not there. Now the reason I'm saying this is because of the way the New Testament treats this. You have to understand that the Old Testament is very important for the New Testament. In fact, Genesis is even more important. There are over 100 references from Genesis in the New Testament. Over 60 of those come from the first 11 chapters. What's in the first 11 chapters of the Bible? Adam and Eve, the fall, Noah's flood, and the Tower of Babel. Abraham's chapter 12. Wait a second. Every single New Testament author references those chapters? And they do it matter-of-factly, as if those things really happened and those people were real people. In fact, Jesus himself, at least 16 times in the Gospels, direct references to Genesis 1 through 11, including this passage in Mark chapter 10. But from the beginning, wow, that's the opening words of a scroll of Genesis. From the beginning of creation, a direct quote from Genesis, God made the male and female. Another direct quote from Genesis. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Um, did Jesus really believe that Adam existed at the beginning of creation. If he did, then he's saying that evolution didn't happen. Because evolution has homo sapiens evolving at the end of the timeline, just a few thousand years ago, not at the beginning. Now, I know people struggle with this. I, mean, I know I struggle with this. But I want you to consider the words of Jesus to Nicodemus the Pharisee. I mean, right after this is John 3.16, we, we know that passage, but here... Uh, Nicodemus is saying things like, can a man be born again? He's really struggling with what Jesus is telling you. Uh, Nicodemus is also one of the men who brought spices to, after Jesus was crucified to the tombs. So this is a very important little conversation they're having at that night because he's afraid. But Jesus says, if I have told you earthly things, and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Well, I believe one of the main reasons why Christianity is struggling to remain relevant in our culture today is because people have thrown out the earthly things in the Bible. That's the science and the history. And therefore, the spiritual things, like a baby with a bathwater, the spiritual things get thrown out also. Because if those old guys who wrote the Bible have so much wrong about history and science, those are the same people who wrote things about God and Jesus. How do you know they got that right if they got so much of the other wrong? It's a perplexing question. The Bible is consistent, consistent in the treatment of Genesis as a foundational document. Look at what Paul says in Romans 5. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, through sin, so death spread to all men because all sin. Who is that one man? Adam. But if death came through Adam, there's no evolution. Because evolution requires billions of years of death to produce people from bacteria. If death is a punishment for sin, sin didn't start until Adam rebelled against God. I'm going to speak heresy here. Pardon me. Not the first part, but Jesus was God, right? God can do anything he wants, right? Right? Therefore, Jesus could come down to earth and say, Hey, y'all, your sins are forgiven. Have a nice day. Go back up to heaven, right? Why not? Because in the garden, God said, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil you shall not eat. From the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. God said a very simple formula. The penalty for sin equals death. Something had to die to satisfy this law. And you know what? God doesn't accept the death of sinful people. It requires a perfect sacrifice to satisfy the wrath of God. That's why Jesus had to die to pay for sins. The whole scene 
at Calvary is wrapped up in the scene in Genesis chapter 2. The Garden of Eden, the cross, are like this. And if we get rid of this Garden of Eden scene, we can't explain why there's death in the world. And, submit to you, you're going to struggle explaining why Jesus' is death pays for anything. I, I tried. I tried hard. I couldn't do it. Maybe you're a better theologian than I am. That, that might not, that's not impossible, but it's a struggle. And reading what the other theologians who don't, who try to discount Genesis, what they write about this link, it, it's, it's just a mess. There's no clear statement because they can't make a clear statement because they understand this very simple thing that sin equals death and how important it is for the cross. But we know what happened, right? I mean, Adam rebelled against God. He ate that fruit. And because of that, God said to Adam, Cursed is the ground because of you, and pain you should eat of it all the days of your life. Wow. But it's not just the dirt that's cursed, it's the universe. The universe being cursed from Adam's rebellion against God contradicts the whole evolutionary story. Look at Romans here. And I was surprised uh, when I realized how many references to creation were here. The creation waits with eager longing. The creation was subject to, to futility. The creation itself will be set free from the bondage to corruption. The whole creation, Greek word there is catissus, means everything. The whole creation has been growing together in the pains of childbirth until now. Paul keeps harping on the fact that the entire universe is weighed down by the weight of Adam's sin. That makes no sense in the evolutionary context. We want restoration. You can't get restoration unless you have a corruption. We want all things to be made new. Well, new means that they are corrupted from their original. We want things to be fixed. Fixed because this whole sin and death and disease and, and all the trials of life aren't supposed to be here. And we desire to be rescued from our condition. But for the Christian, there's a beautiful promise to us. This is Revelation 21, 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. What are the former things? It's all the junk we got from Adam. Why do I say that? Because in the same context, it says, there is no more curse. That started in Genesis. And then the tree of life reappears. Oh, that was taken away from us in Genesis. Have you ever realized that the end of the Bible is fixing the problem set up in the beginning of the Bible. And they're like golden threads that run throughout the entire scripture that unite this whole thing into one story. You know what this is? This black squiggly line, those are all the chapters in the Bible. The rainbow, that's all the cross references amongst all the chapters of the Bible. You can't pull those first 50 chapters, which is Genesis, or the first 11 chapters out, without destroying the integrity of the rest of scripture. Because all the other Bible writers quote from Genesis, Adam, Cain, Noah, as historical figures, in the same exact way they'll make a reference to King David or Solomon as historical figures. They don't put caveats, they don't, they don't say, yeah, but. They say, Adam. And then draw some very important theological conclusions from the reality of Adam. only a few thousand years old, as scripture indicates, we do have problems. Because secular science was trying to tell us that the earth is millions of years old. Can we explain something like a fossil record in just thousands of years? Well, remember the Mount St. Helens example? Remember the Orville Dam example I gave you a little while ago? We saw a lot of geology happen quickly. Well, what if something even larger than those things happened in the Earth's past? Of course, now we're looking at Noah's flood. Genesis chapter 6, verse 13. The earth had become very wicked. God had gotten sick and tired of man. And all the wickedness, all the evil. And he's going to reboot the whole system. He tells Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh. For the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So he tells Noah to build a large ship. We call that an ark. And in the 600th year of Noah's life, the second month, the 17th day. Now, I know most people more aren't science geeks like me. I got that. 
I made C's in high school English. It was, it was terrible. French class, oh, I don't even want to think about that. I am not good with words. So would one of you who's good with the English language, or languages in general, help me out here? What genre is that? Poetry? Prophecy? Allegory? Or historical narrative? Did the author of this expect us to think that something happened on a specific day of a specific person's life? Yeah, that's, that's really specific history on that day of this historical account. All the fountains of great deep burst forth, and the windows of heaven were opened. Rain fell upon the earth forty days and forty nights. Okay, that's nice. Did that really happen? If it happened, what would you expect to see? That's a question that the church got wrong in the late 1700s and early 1800s. Most of the theologians at the time accepted deep time. Most of the Christians who were scientists at the time had strange ideas about you know, catastrophic episodes that happened in Earth's history millions of years ago. Very few people were trying to build a biblical model of the world. Now, some were, but we don't hear about them much because history has pushed them off to the side. But if the flood really happened, what would you expect to see? Everywhere I go now, I'm trying to see evidence from Noah's flood, and we can see it if we look carefully. Let me give you two big ideas. Two overwhelmingly big ideas that explain most of the fossil record. First, think about what rapidly rising muddy water is going to leave behind. And if we're flooding continents, think of the scale that we should directly predict from the Noah's flood account. Second, think about what rapidly rushing water is going to do to those newly deposited sediments as it comes back off of the earth. I predict massive amounts of erosion, but not from rivers. Erosion flowing in sheets of water that leave very weird things behind. Things that aren't explained by modern erosion. You've all seen pictures of Monument Valley. If you ever watched a Jane, John Wayne movie, like three quarters of them were filmed in Monument Valley. Have you ever noticed that all the beats and mesas had the same height? They were carved from a plane. And these rocks, when you go north, east, south, and west, they dip underneath other rocks. There's about a mile of missing rocks in the, in the fossil record here. Something erased the surface of the earth down about a mile, created a flat plain. And then, maybe as you know, those floods, waters started to get shallower, they channeled, and as they trickled off the continents, finally, they left these really weird things behind. Because modern erosion is destroying these beasts and mesas. Nothing's creating vertical cliffs. Every force is rounding these things off. And where's all the sand? Where are the boulders? They've been washed off the continent. Clear, uh, nearby there, we have Grand Canyon again. Can you see the flat plain on the top of the canyon? You stand on, on the rim of your Grand Canyon, you look north, you see what's called the Grand Staircase. Bryce Canyon's in there, a couple of famous monuments. But it's about a mile of different colored rocks that used to be over the top of Grand Canyon. We know that because every once in a while there's a hillock or something on this plain that has the same exact fossil record layers as in Grand Staircase. Something erased the earth to a flat plain and then carved a canyon in the top of a hill. Grand Canyon is a water gap. That's a place where a river is supposed to flow around a high point, but instead it flows right down the middle of it. The high point of the canyon is in the middle of the canyon. Weird. This really looks like something that was carved quickly and catastrophically, not slowly and gradually. I think it's all great evidence for the known for a biblical flood. But we have to understand the flood was not gentle. This is a massive episode that caused suffering, death, and extinction. This is not a kid's story with a happy little smiling giraffe sticking his neck out the window. This is a horror story. This is the wrath of God poured out on wickedness. Yuck! But in the middle of all this is a beautiful strain of salvation. Because through faith in God, Noah came through the waters of death and came out alive on the other side. What does the New Testament tell us about faith? Anyone who puts their faith in Jesus Christ is going to be ushered through that second fiery judgment. Found well, alive on the other side to inherit eternal life. How do you survive the wrath of God? It's through faith. Through faith alone. We also
also have to get a grasp on the size of Noah's Ark. Uh, the size depends upon the length of a cubit, and whether or not it's a royal cubit or a regular cubit, and how large the person was, we don't really know. But a general cubit would make an ark about one and a half football fields long. If you were to take the inside volume of the ark, counting for the thickness of the wood, and put out the railroad cars, you'd have a train more than five miles long. There's tons of room on board that vessel, two of every kind of animal. All the food and all the water they need, not for 40 days and 40 nights, but for the entire year that they spend on board. Now, how many animals is that? That depends on where you draw the line. But since lions and tigers can interbreed, and in fact, all the big cats can interbreed, and they can interbreed with pumas, and they can interbreed with lynxes, and they can interbreed with wild cats, and they can interbreed with house cats, there's one genetic continuum from a, ch a tiger to your key. That's one connected group, as if there's only one type of cat that has spread out on the earth after the flood in the first spot. Well, if you want to say that the level of what a biblical kind is, what God created in the beginning, is that the level? That's the family. There's only 800 families of vertebrate animals that have to be brought onto the ark. Only 800 pairs of animals? Wow, that's including all the extinct ones too, by the way. Now, if you want to get more conservative, say, man, it's the level of the genus. Okay, that's about 12,000 pairs of animals. There's still plenty of room. Now, it's not going to be fun. It's going to be an awful lot of work. I don't want to be on board that vessel when the flies and the fleas break out. But the good husbandry, even the six people on board the ark could have taken care of those animals. The statistics have already been calculated. We know how much food, how much water, how much work. This is doable if they did it smartly. And it's really easy if there's a lot less animals. So I don't know, pick a number. There's something else really cool about the ark. If you look at the height to width to length ratio of the boat that's described in Genesis, that ship was optimally designed for stability. We discovered this formula by accident in the 1800s. They built this giant, uh, one of those, those steamships with the paddle wheels on the side for crossing the ocean. It's called the Great Eastern. It didn't last very long. But when they got on board that ship, they are like, man, this thing is really stable. Let's build more ships like this. And that was a broken modern ocean liner. Noah's Ark has the same proportions. If you don't think that you can build a wooden ship this large, the Chinese built flat bottom junks the size of Noah's Ark, multiple of them, and sailed them around the ocean. They probably discovered Australia. They definitely discovered the Philippines. They made it as far as Madagascar. On Noah's Ark size wooden ships on the open ocean. So the stability of it, the formula of it, in fact, the, the fact that that formula is in scripture to me is one of the greatest testimonies, testimonies to the scientific reliability of Genesis. Because no one would have predicted that formula just randomly. And they nailed it. Boom, that's a perfect ship for stability. Now, I've given you lots of examples of fossils, but I just want to give you one more. It's a jellyfish. A petrified jellyfish. How do you petrify human? Well, obviously it had to occur quickly, right? This is also a living fossil. I saw a picture of this in uh, Plus One, it was a pretty famous evolutionary journal. I saw this picture, and I knew what it was. I've seen it before. They had another picture of another jellyfish. I said, oh yeah, that's one of those symbols. It's one of those things about that day that killed people in Australia. And sure enough, it's on the bottom, it said, you know, fossilized cubozoa. Oh yeah, okay, that's what it is. How can I recognize this animal? They've supposedly been dead for 505 millions of years. That's before the vertebra evolved. That's before fish. That's before dinosaurs. That's before land life. This is like early, early, early evolutionary model, multicellular life, and it's still the same? Oh, well, maybe it didn't need to change. It was perfectly adapted to its environment. Nonsense. Haven't you ever heard of climate change? The climate has changed radically in the evolutionary model. Like, I think the climate has changed radically because of Noah's flood. That's a whole other topic for another day. But if the environment changes, in like fact, sea turtles, one of the favorite foods of sea turtles is jellyfish. And sea turtles supposedly didn't evolve until way after jellyfish evolved. Everything has changed. They can't stay the same. This is a contradiction in the evolutionary model 
And honestly, I've never seen a good answer for something like this, but it's not just jellyfish. There are living fossils on every branch of the tree of life. Bees, butterflies, worms, you name it, it hasn't changed since it first appeared. Yeah, there are a couple of transitional forms that they talk about today. This is true. There are always going to be claims of transitional fossils. But the ones they talk about today were not the ones they were talking about when I was in college. And those weren't the ones I saw in National Geographic in the 1970s. And those weren't the ones that they talk about in the 1925 Scopes Monkey Trial. And those weren't the ones that they were talking about in Darwin's day. They have a flash span of transitional fossils about 10 years before they finally push them off to the side. Oh yeah, well, we now know. I love that. You know what that phrase means? We were wrong. We now know that that's not a transitional fossil. So don't be deceived. Think through these issues very carefully, stepwise approach them. And when you have a question like this that you necessarily can't answer right away, just put it on the back shelf of your mind. Say, I'm going to go check that out in a couple of years, maybe I'll learn more information. And almost certainly, some claim about a transitional fossil or something that will be answered. Now, I didn't cover everything. I can't. I only did a couple of highlights of a couple of the issues. There are a lot more. So if you've got some remaining questions, where do you go? First, read your Bibles. The Bible's going to answer more questions than you expect. Second, maybe just go to Christian.com. Perfectly free, thousands of pounds, thousands of articles. You can read until your dying breath. You're not going to run out of articles to read. You might want to take a, a look at one of our books or our, um, our DVDs in the back. And here's Creation Magazine. I'm going to just explain this to you because someone might uh, want to get Creation Magazine. It comes out four times a year. We work really hard on this. If you get a two-year subscription, we'll include the digital version of our magazine, which we'll send out as an email. And we'll let you share it with other people, so it's a great thing to share. And anyone can read it, phone, tablet, <coughs> laptop, desktop, whatever electronic device there is. We'll also sign you up for our monthly newsletter, like our prayer news update, things like that. And we're going to include two documentaries. One is that fallout that I talked about earlier, about 35 minutes long, straight out of the mouths of college students. And the other one is going to be our Darwin, The Voyage to Shook the World. This is um, our first movie we ever made. We did this in honor of Charles Darwin's 200th birthday. We went to a documentary, a National Ge Geographic style documentary, on the life of Charles Darwin. So we went around the world tracing his footsteps and we interviewed all these evolutionists and a few creationists to just tell us about the legacy of that man. If you want to understand the creation evolution debate, you've got to understand Darwin. And he's a fascinating, interesting individual. Not what most people expect. And after that, you know, someone after this is going to ask me for advice. It almost always happens. And I'm going to point them probably to that red book, the creation answer the book. We wrote that to answer the top 60 questions that we've done. That's 99% of our questions. Like, what about Starlight? How do you get it here in the universe is only thousands of years old? What about Neanderthal? What about carbon dating? All those sorts of questions we put into one book. We also have a pack called a starter pack. That's a creation answers book. That's a number one best-selling creation evolution book ever written, refuting evolution. It uses eighth grade science to rebut a list of evidences for evolution that the National Academy of Sciences put together. That's a powerful book. The pack also comes with a DVD. Here's Evolution's Achilles Heels, the book and the documentary. Very interesting, very powerful, nothing but PhD scientists. Most of what we do at CMI, we are, we're defending our position, we're defending the Bible, we're trying to you know, give creationist answers, but this is, you know, we turn the tables on the evolutionists. We said, this is the best arguments we have, and we are going for the goal line, and we're on yard one, and we're going to get a touchdown that evolutionists defend. It's amazing that they were pretty much silent over this. Other things we've done, they've made entire websites dedicated to refuting it. But this one, there was crickets. I think we scored a big goal here, and that's out there on the tables. The Deep Time Deception is a book that deals with deep time, where we get it, how, how do we deal with it, how does it apply, how it affects the world. Some really cool stuff in there, some good gospel stuff in there at the end also. How Noah's Flood Shaped Our Earth deals with geology and rocks and minerals and all sorts of things like that. We also have some stuff on more of an elementary level. Exploring geology with Mr. Hibb, just a little cricket. He's going around the world exploring rocks and minerals and fossils and dinosaurs. In fact, that was such a big seller, we did a second one called Exploring Dinosaurs with Mr. Hibb. 
And there's some really cool stuff in there. It's probably uh, fifth, sixth, seventh grade level. The Genesis Academy, we built a sound stage in our warehouse to film professionally a 12 part series on the first 11 chapters of Genesis. This is a two year production. I cannot tell you how hard it was. We each had to develop our talk and give it to the other presenters three times, and then we got shredded. They said, oh, you can't say that, this and that, and we honed each other to a fine, sharp edge, and then finally presented it on camera. And it came out really, really good. There's a study guide online. You just go to grace.com, type in study guide. That is great for Bible studies, Wednesday night, Sunday school, personal study, group study, whatever. It's there for you, and we've got a lot of really good comments on that. But you know, my purpose here is not to sell you books. Not at all. But what, all, what I can do is point you to where some of the answers lie. I, I, my salary is not dependent upon what happens here this morning. But I have brought some things that might touch a life. And that's all I want to do. I just want to touch people's lives. Because you know people who are asking this question. You might be asking them yourself, but you also know people who are asking the questions that can now be answered. And I will leave you with 1 Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, and always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you, and do it with gentleness and respect. I tried to model that this morning. I mean, I know I can be a jerk, but my Irish temper gets really fired up when people start insulting me. I, I know that. I got to be careful about that. But our model here is to answer gently and respectfully because harsh and sarcastic facts shouting to anger don't usually point people toward the kingdom of God. But a gentle answer, even this one, my last little bit of advice, when you don't know the answer, what do you do? You say, I don't know the answer to that. I will be honest. But I'm going to go to creation.com and I'm going to read up on it and I'm going to come back tomorrow and we're going to keep on talking. You know why that's a fair answer? First, you're being honest. Second, they don't expect you to come back. Most people who are not raised in church, come in. They became a Christian through the loving, constant, patient administration of their family and friends. Most people don't become a Christian by hearing a guy standing on a corner on a soapbox. Yes, it can happen, but that's not the usual case. It's usually friendship evangelism. People interacting with other people over a time. And yet, yeah, dropping a gospel track is a great thing. Hearing a preaching is a wonderful thing. But that's sometimes a camel, the straw that breaks the camel's back. And sometimes it's something that starts a person on a journey. We're all, I mean, how many of you, when you became a Christian, it was like that? A few of us. Not most of us. And for those of you that was like that, I'm actually a little jealous. It took me a long time time before I finally bent my knee because of my own arrogance, I guess. But I resisted God for a long time. When my answer started coming in, though, accepting the truth, that accepting God as a fact was much easier and it didn't have all this baggage behind me that was hindering me. Just, just, I hope you enjoyed that. It was really nice meeting some of you. The rest of you I might talk to afterwards. Let's pray. Let's pray and then serve the Father, thank you so much for the beautiful world that you created. Thank you for giving us the scriptures. You didn't have to do that. No other religion has a book like this. You've told us where everything came from. You've told us why everything is. You've told us where everything is going. What a wonderful thing. You've given us answers to some of these gigantic, perplexing questions so they don't have to vex our faith. Lord, we know that we haven't studied as much as we should. We know we don't know as much as we should. We know, Lord, that many times we have been cowed into silence because we've been afraid to talk, either through intimidation, through being tripped up by our own sins, or because we just don't know enough of the Bible to actually talk about it. But we also know that you're a good and loving God, and we know you're patient because you haven't thrown us off to the side. You've picked us up time and time again. We're asking you one more time. Pick us up, dust us off, set us on our feet, give us a swat in the rear if we need it. But 
just help us to go open our mouths. And Father, take us little church, these faithful people that we've been meeting here all these years. Bless them to be a light on the hill, the dark community in which they live. Help them to know, to see spiritual needs of the people around them, because the needs are great. Father, help us all as we go through life to seek only to serve you and to please you with our thoughts, our actions, 